Without further ado, I am thrilled to uh, introduce Dr. Vitaly Napado as today's distinguished speaker. Dr. Napado is professor at Harvard Medical School and director of the Scott Schoen and Nancy Adams Discovery Center for Recovery from Chronic Pain at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital. He also directs the Center for Integrative Pain Neuroimaging at the Martino Center for Biomedical Imaging at MGH. He has a PhD in biomedical engineering from MIT and Harvard University, and he has applied these skills to pain neuroscience research for the past 20 years, elucidating somatosensory, cognitive, and affective factors that influence the malleable experience of chronic pain. He's his lab has applied human functional and structural neuroimaging to localize and suggest mechanisms by which different brain circuitries modulate pain perception. His neuroimaging research also aims to better understand how non-pharmacologic therapies from acupuncture to transcutaneous neuromodulation to cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness meditation training ameliorate the suffering from chronic pain. He has over 200 publications and is the past president of the Society for Acupuncture Research. So today we are treated with his talk on brain mechanisms supporting patient clinician therapeutic alliance in pain care, a hyperscan approach, um, as Ashley mentioned, he's going to be speaking for about 45 minutes, and then there'll be plenty of time for Q&A, so please chat your questions um, into the Q&A, and those will be teed up for Dr. Napado at the end of his lecture. Um, and with that, uh, Dr. Napado, the stage is yours. Well, thank you very much, Beth. That was um, a lovely introduction. Very much appreciated, and it's a real pleasure for me to be here and to present to you all some of our lab's research. So I'm going to share screen now, and um, maybe you can let me know, first of all, perfect. if everything looks perfect. Great. Yep. Okay. Excellent. So um, today I'm going to be speaking about some of our lab's work, trying to understand really the, the mechanisms behind what I think a lot of people consider to be sort of the art of medicine, which is the way that clinicians interact with their patients and how that might lead to beneficial clinical outcomes, surprisingly enough. And um, really, because I'm a neuroimager, we're going to be talking mostly about brain imaging and how brain imaging tools can be used and can be applied to better understand this. So therapeutic alliance is going to be kind of the main construct that we're interested in here, the therapeutic alliance between a patient and their clinician. And one important thing to understand is that therapeutic alliance is actually a key element of many different kinds of clinical therapies, uh, both hands-on therapies, but also psychotherapies. It's just a really important construct in clinical care in general. So we know that therapeutic alliance impacts clinical outcomes. Social interactions significantly shape how we feel, how we conceptualize pain. Um, interesting study back in 2013 in an RCT of spinal manipulation and exercise for low back pain found that therapeutic alliance was in fact a, a predictor and even a moderator of pain and other outcomes. And in this paper, the authors even suggested that we could boost the efficacy of certain interventions by enhancing therapeutic alliance. Also, when specifically looking at psychotherapy, as in this meta-analysis by Bruce Wampold back in 2015, um, they found that factors such as empathy and alliance, um, you know, heretofore known as contextual factors or sometimes even nonspecific factors, actually had some of the largest effect sizes in terms of clinical outcomes after psychotherapy. So we know these concepts are very important. They're also very important for burnout, for clinician burnout. This has become a growing problem in our clinical ranks, and clinician burnout is a major problem, greater than 50% of MDs report burnout in some studies, and this is actually before the COVID epidemic. So now those numbers would be even higher. And burnout is due to many factors. It's really, it's really multifactorial. There's ideas on compassion fatigue, empathic dissonance, and lots of theories that are out there in terms of why clinicians and physicians are reporting burnout. But what's interesting is that in some of this research, um, researchers have found that better communication skills are associated with, with a reduced 
risk of burnout. So somehow if we are able to improve communication skills between clinicians and patients, it doesn't just improve the um, clinical care um, or the clinical outcomes of the patient, it can also improve how the clinician perceives themselves and also their risk of burnout. So these factors are indeed quite important. So how do we understand mechanisms? That's really a key thing and, and has been very difficult you know, up to this point. One interesting thing is that when looking at clinical and social neuroscience research, a lot of this work has really paradoxically applied imaging, brain imaging techniques to just a single individual, such as just the clinician or just the patient to try to answer questions of mechanisms, of brain-based mechanisms supporting some of, this, some of these concepts. And I think what I would argue is that it's when you're passively processing some sort of stimuli, either as a patient or as a clinician, this is different than the kinds of dynamic interactions that patients and clinicians are typically engaged in during a clinical encounter. And so this requires kind of dynamic real life social interactions. And so the question is, how do we do that? How do we have like a, a two person method for brain imaging? And this is really what we're trying to get to is to try to understand brain-based mechanisms in both patients and clinicians, which can only truly be understood by studying both systems together. So there have been um, uh, attempts at looking at kind of the social neuroscience and interaction. Uh, it's, it starts in basic science. This is a really interesting recent study that came out of um, UCLA, looking at two rats, and the two rats have um, this uh, calcium imaging uh, in dorsomedial prefrontal cortex in their brains. And the wiring allows for the rats to be either with a um, with a barrier between them where they can't interact, they can't see each other versus no barrier where they are interacting. And what's interesting is that when you do have this contact, you have start having synchrony in brain responses from this part of the brain, the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. And that's significantly different between a no contact condition. So we know that um, one interesting thing that comes out of this is that when two beings are interacting with one another, you start having this neural synchrony. And so the way to study this in humans is through methods called hyperscanning or hyperscan neuroimaging, where we can um, apply these methods to assess and quantify brain-to-brain -brain concordance. And so hyperscanning just means the synchronous neuroimaging of more than one individual. A lot of these methods have used EEG or electroencephalography, where, for example, you have a pilot and a co-pilot, sorry, wired up with um, these nets, these EEG nets, and then you have like a simulator and how they interact and that the synchrony between the two brains, the brain signals between pilot and a co-pilot are greatest during like most kind of like relevant and arousing times, such as the liftoff and landing of an airplane. Um, there's this, these methods have been applied to understand juggling and how the two individuals in a circus school learn how to juggle with one another. And of course, for music performance, when you have a duet for example, how the two musicians interact with one another, looking at brain-to-brain -brain synchrony during this period. But these methods have not been applied yet to a clinical encounter. So there's also functional MRI hyperscanning. And since most of my background is actually in functional MRI, um, that was what, what myself and our lab was mostly interested in, is how do we use functional MRI hyperscanning methods, which in, in many cases are much more rare. These are more sort of difficult to execute, I would say. So fMRI hyperscanning um, has some advantages. It has, first of all, you can assess subcortical brain activity, not just on the cortex like EEG, and you have improved spatial localization compared to EEG. So the question is, how do we do this? Um, there have been coils that have been created that allow for more than one individual to fit inside of an MRI scanner. And this might be okay for say, you know, romantic couples or familial bonds, but it's probably uh, not appropriate for a patient-clinician interaction, but definitely not appropriate for a patient-clinician interaction. And so in our study, what we've done is actually use two synchronized scanners in two different rooms, one housing a patient, one housing a clinician. And our hypothesis is that concordance in social mirroring brain circuitries underlies the patient-clinician relationship. And so the question is, you know, what are mirror neurons? So um, without going too deeply into this, Mirror neurons were sort of discovered in the early 1990s um, in experiments out of Italy where um, an experimenter was um, 
Uh, interestingly enough, you know, they had a, a monkey that was wired up in a certain experiment, looking at premotor planning for grasping motions, and they were taking a lunch break, and the uh, the experimenter took a banana out for lunch, and the monkey was watching the experimenter eat the banana, and suddenly um, their brain activity in these grasping motions started going crazy. And the experimenter was very interested in this, and they discovered that there are these mirror neuron areas in the brain where if you see somebody doing something, the part of your brain that's also might be um, related to that from a premotor standpoint will also activate, will also start to light up. And so from this, they were able to map out this motor mirror neuron system, which has since been kind of expanded to also encompass a social mirroring circuitry. So there's mirror neurons that are present in the brain beyond the motor system. And so there's somatosensory um, mirroring and primary somatosensory cortex and even empathy and social mirroring systems, which include brain areas such as ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, anterior insula, and TPJ or temporal parietal junction. And so that was kind of our prior. This is the social mirroring circuitry is what we were um, chasing after. And our hypothesis was that the degree to which clinicians' social mirror neuron systems accurately reflect patients' own brain responses to clinically relevant stimuli plays an important role in nonverbal cues of how they're interacting and patients' perception of what we might call a therapeutic alliance with their clinicians and ultimately leading to better clinical efficacy. So in our study, we recruited fibromyalgia patients. Um, so we had actual patients that were recruited and coming in for these studies. And the patients were randomized to either first have a, an intake, a clinical intake with a provider. In this case, it was an acupuncturist, so an acupuncture clinician. And then continue for a hyperscan functional MRI study, where again, they were placed in these two different scanners. Or they were randomized to come in and not have this intake. They did not form a bond or have a relationship with their acupuncturists, and then went straight to the hyperscan fMRI for like a control condition. And then there was a crossover. Then they came back another time. And if they first had the intake, now they were paired with a different acupuncturist and did not have an intake and vice versa. And from an acupuncturist point of view, they were just told to perform an intake in a similar manner as you do in your own practice. And this allowed for natural variability and sort of therapeutic alliance because different clinicians have different, uh, different uh, capacities for bonding with their patients. So our hyperscan fMRI setup included, again, two scanners, one with a clinician, one uh, housing a patient. Um, there was video cameras, MRI-compatible video cameras and audio microphone. The video cameras um, uh, were able to focus in on the face of the clinician and on the face of the patient, which was then projected to the other MRI scanner. Um, so that they could see each other's faces for this kind of nonverbal communication during scanning. There was a laptop that was controlling uh, when the scanner would start in one MRI system, and then that signal was passed on to another laptop in the other MRI system so we could have a uh, pretty exact uh, synchronization of the two MRI scanners. So the, the, the MRI scanners were basically wired together so that we could have consistent and synchronous um, scanning. And the software that we wrote in-house was also able to monitor the when certain scans were happening in two different scanners to make sure that the delay did not extend beyond, say, um, tens uh, of milliseconds. Because as we know, if there's if you get to around 300, 400 milliseconds, you start feeling this weird delay, um, which, you know, probably sometimes you do see that because of uh, poor broadband or something like that. You have a delay in when you see my face doing something and when you hear my voice, and that's that's gonna be a problem. So we made sure that that didn't happen in this experiment. So the way the experiment worked was that there was, um, the patient was had a, a cuff wrapped around their leg that would inflate in order to induce a pain, a, a, like a deep tissue sort of pain, which is uh, very relevant for fibromyalgia patients. Uh, acupuncture needles were inserted above the knee and electrodes were attached to those needles so, so that the acupuncturist could perform electroacupuncture with a button press, and they were holding a button press in their scanner. So the, the, button, the button box, which was held by the patient, could be used to report pain, for example, and the by the acupuncturist could be used to control an electroacupuncture device that we wired in order to perform electroacupuncture in the other scanner. And so this was part of our way to try to make this very sort of artificial construct be as ecologically valid as possible 
um, because electroacupuncture is something that acupuncturists typically do in their practice. And so they could um, effectively treat a patient even though they were in a remote room lying inside of an MRI scanner. That was the whole goal of this experiment is, for, is to like try to explore brain activity during associated with treatment during treatment of a patient, chronic pain patient. So we collected a, a wealth of data, including cardiac, respiratory, skin conductance data, and of course, what's called bold fMRI or blood oxygen level dependent functional MRI responses from the brains to look at brain activity in both the clinicians who are treating the patients and in the patients who are being treated by the clinician. Our main uh, clinical outcome, behavioral outcome in this study was um, therapeutic alliance. And this was quantified by a questionnaire called the CARE Consultational Relational Empathy Questionnaire. And this you know, asks a series of questions around whether the clinician's really listening to you. Are they interested in you as a whole person? Are they showing care and compassion? These kinds of questions. And so this gets at kind of like a therapeutic alliance between the patient and the clinician. And so this is some of the results. These are the care scores as reported by both, oh, sorry, both the clinicians and the patients. And so, um, by the way, this study was executed by um, a, a brilliant postdoc in the lab, Dan Michael Ellingson, who is now at University of Oslo and, and uh, Christianina University in, in Norway as a, as a faculty member. So he did a wonderful job while he was in the lab here. Um, so the patients, uh, reported really high levels. This is basically the um, almost maxing out in terms of uh, the therapeutic alliance that they found as delivered by their by their acupuncturists during the intake, and also related to social interaction during the social interaction MRI. And this was significantly greater than what they reported for uh, if they didn't have that intake and they just saw them in the in the MRI on the other side. And so this is kind of like an internal validity for experiment. You know, there is greater therapeutic alliance if you have a chance to meet, if you have a chance to um, to to discuss um, uh, something about your clinical condition. And with the clinicians, they also found um, uh, very high levels of therapeutic alliance, specifically when they were able to do the intake versus uh, the no interaction condition. And I think an important thing here is that for the patient's standpoint, there was no difference between the care scores from the intake when they're there face-to-face -face interacting with one another versus when they're in the social interaction MRI condition where they're in these like separate MRI scanners. So for them, it wasn't, uh, what's, good, what's good for us to see is that there wasn't such like a big difference or a loss in ecological validity, which would have been picked up by a reduction in therapeutic alliances rated by the patients. And so that was very nice, even if the uh, the acupuncturist did find that it was a little bit limiting for themselves to have the patient in the other MRI scanner. So not, not terribly surprising. First of all, what happens when you have this situation, you're experiencing a pain. So, so providing a pain to a chronic pain patient in an MRI scanner to look at brain response is a very common technique. This has been, people have been doing this kind of research for over 20 years. So what happens when you have a hyperscan condition and you now have a clinician that's you know, present there with you in a way um, that you can see their face throughout the entire experiment? And so that's what the question that we asked here is without any treatment whatsoever, what about just the presence of having the clinician, clinician there? And so we had this solo condition when pain was delivered and, the cl and um, without the clinician being present versus the dyadic condition where pain was provided to the patient and the clinician was present. And so the experiment, uh, the protocol design and functional MRI had a resting period followed by this box that would light up around the face of the other. And both the patient and the clinician would see this box light up and the color of the box would signal whether um, there, in this case, there would not be any pain. So the, the cuff would inflate, but to a very low degree and they would not feel any pain or it would inflate to a level that would produce a moderate pain um, in the patient. And so then there was a period, so this, this anticipation cue was there for six to 12 seconds, followed by 15 seconds of the pain actually arriving or the no pain condition in this case. And then there would be a rest period and then both the patient and the clinician would rate pain and empathy scores after that. So the patient would rate how painful was the cuff and the clinician would rate how painful did you think it was for the patient. So it's kind of like a vicarious pain. And so what we found is that patients actually 
experienced less pain, even though the pressure was exactly the same, patients experienced less pain when they were watched by their clinician. So the dyadic versus the SOA condition did produce statistically significant differences in the pain ratings that the patient was providing to the same intensity of pressure. And when we looked at the brain responses, what was interesting is that we found that there was greater brain response to pain when they were watched by that clinician, but only if the relationship was formed by a prior interaction. So here's where it matters if they had the interaction, the clinical intake prior or did not. If there was no prior clinical intake and they were just meeting some you know, stranger off the street who were telling them is a clinician, then there was actually no difference between the dyadic and the solo condition in terms of brain response in the patient but the brain response in the patient was significantly greater if now they are being watched by their um, by somebody that they do have this relationship with, and mostly in in brain areas associated with kind of cognitive control and top down modulation of pain in the brain. So what about what about when we are providing treatment? So so it's a very similar design, you know, that I just explained before. The um, functional MRI condition starts with a resting scan for a period of time. Then there, the box would light up, an anticipation cue. And in this case, red means that you're about to receive the pain, but you're not going to get treated by electroacupuncture. Green means you're about to receive the pain, and you are going to get treated by electroacupuncture. And then this would pass into the condition where the cuff would actually inflate, and the patients would feel pain. This would be followed by a resting state and followed by ratings of pain and affect. In this case, it was how painful was the cuff for the patient and how painful did you think the cuff pressure was for the patient as rated by the clinician. So again, it's kind of vicarious pain response. And this was repeated 12 times. So we had 12 repetition of this in order to uh, boost our um, interpretability. So what were some of the results? Um, we found that First of all, there was analgesia when there was treatment, electroacupuncture treatment by the, um, by the electroacupuncture device. So treated versus no treated trials produced less pain intensity as rated by the patient. Again, even though the pressure was exactly the same. And the acupuncturists, interestingly enough, when they rated this, they found that vicarious pain was significantly lower during the treated trials versus the no treated trials. So they, they thought that their treatment was in fact effective as well, which was interesting, right? Because they, they don't actually see the ratings of the patient. They're just trying to predict what the patient might be feeling. But what was really interesting is when we looked at the um, cross correlation or relationship between the analgesia, the treated minus no treated trials as rated by the patient versus the perceived efficacy, the vicarious pain of treated minus no treated trials. And here we found a um, statistically significant correlation. So somehow when the patient was reporting more analgesia, the clinician was picking up on this and was reporting less vicarious pain during the treated condition uh, than the non-treated condition. And so the question is, is how might acupuncturists accurately perceive this efficacy was it maybe through video transfer of the facial expression, right? Because that's that's all they saw. During the actual experiment, the clinicians were seeing the face of their patient um, experiencing this pain. And so here we recorded the videos uh, for both the patient and the clinician, and we passed them through these um, artificial intelligence algorithms for looking at facial expression. So these, uh, we use a software called Effectiva here, but there's lots of, um, open source software that's out there available now for trying to estimate the facial expressions of, um, of different individuals. And this technology is used, um, you know, in clinical settings, you know, in commercial settings, you know, by marketers, in political settings, and all kinds of um, both uh, positive and kind of like negative usages of this kind of technology. And so we wanted to apply this software to understand facial expressions in response to pain in patients in response to observing the pain in clinicians. And so the way this works is that you have all these um, control points and you have these kind of lower level um, metrics such as you know lid tightening and uh, brow furrowing and things like that, which are then a combination of these things are feeding into kind of cardinal emotions as that's estimated by the software of you know, joy, anger, disgust, surprise, et cetera. And so, there's like a this like mapping that the software is basically doing 
that was trained based on actor responses and based on lots of other um, images that have been out there. And so what we found is that when we um, looked at the treated minus no treated trials and looked at the facial expression of the patients and of the clinicians, we found these like interesting mirroring patterns where here's like the deflection from, from nil from uh, uh, treated minus no treated trials. And you can see that kind of, if you look at this, the shape of for across all of these different emotions is similar between patients and clinicians. And in fact, there's like a nice relationship between the change in facial expression across this. And what was most interesting is that we found that if you look at any individual dyad, patient clinician dyad, and you estimate the mirroring, kind of the, the similarity between facial expression changes for um, the patient and the clinician, and we plot this on the x-axis, there was a nice correlation between mirroring with any given dyad and the amount of therapeutic alliance that was rated by, um, by the patient. So the greater the mirroring, the greater the facial mirroring, this was associated with higher therapeutic alliance scores, right? Higher care scores. And it was also associated with better analgesia. So those dyads that were sort of hallmarked by better facial expression mirroring were also characterized by better analgesia, greater difference in treated minus no treated trials. So the next question we asked is, well, you know, you have this mirroring, but who's who exactly is mirroring whom, right? Um, it could be that the patient is mirroring the clinician in order to try to like foster a better connection. It could be the opposite. The clinician is mirroring the patient in order to, to try to better connect with that patient. And so here we actually looked at the time courses of these facial expression changes. And we use a technique called a uh, Granger causality to look at um, the influence of these time series from patient to clinician and back from clinician to patient to see who exactly was mirroring whom. Um, and the first thing that we found actually is just looking at the patient, what are the lower level facial expressions associated with pain? So when you have the high pain versus a no pain condition, what we found is that the, the change in facial expression is most associated with these kinds of uh, facial expressions, lip suck, eye closure, lid tightening, brow furrowing. And these expressions actually very nicely match uh, much larger end studies. And in our case, because we're doing brain imaging, these are relatively small end studies, but um, people that have done this in a much larger cohort actually find a lot of similarity with the types of uh, facial, what are called facial action units um, associated with pain. So if we're sort of like looking at these facial action units and looking at the transfer of these um, action units and expressions from one individual to another, what we found is pretty unequivocal. It was really a transfer of the patient's expression and these different um, um, uh, facial action units like lip sucking, for example, to the clinician's expression, right? So you have all these like significant hits over here. This is the causal direction of patient to clinician and almost nothing here for a clinician back to patient. So it was really the, the patients experiencing their pain, having a facial expression in response to that, and then the clinician doing their best to try to reach out, to try to make a connection with their patient. And so they're mirroring the facial expression of the patient in order to do so. That's, that's kind of the result that we found here. And so then the question is, why do clinicians mirror their patients, right? Well, mirroring is pretty universal. From a very early age, babies learn to imitate the facial expressions of their caregivers in order to build an alliance, right? Babies are relatively helpless beings. If they are not given care by a caregiver, they will die. And so evolutionarily, babies basically went through this process of trying to bond as well as possible with their caregivers, their mothers, their fathers, et cetera. And they do so by mirroring their facial expression to build this relationship. And so the question is, does clinician-patient mirroring also reflect, in this case, a therapeutic alliance and empathy? And is this supported by brain concordance in social mirroring circuitry. So now we're looking at brain response and we're looking at brain response during this hyperscanning experiment. And um, in order to kind of like focus on a period of time during the experiment where both the patient and the clinician were seeing the same stimulus, we looked at this anticipation cue period where both are just seeing the face of the other and then seeing this kind of box light up around the other's face. And when we looked at brain response during this period of time, what we found is that in the patients, you get all this like really nice innovation in 
a lot of like social mirror circuitry areas, actually, like temporal parietal junction, ventral lateral prefrontal cortex. And then in clinicians, you see the same thing. And interestingly enough, in the clinicians, it's actually an even stronger response in a lot of these areas, which was kind of surprising to us, right? Because it's it's the patient that's anticipating this pain coming. They're about to feel the pain, but it's the clinician who's actually activating stronger than, than the patient even is in response to this anticipation cue. So they, they, clinicians were very engaged, I think, in this experiment. And then what we did is we looked at a conjunction. So we looked to see where in the brain, so across all the voxels in the cortex, where, where in the brain do you see common activation in both patients and clinicians during this period of time? And this like very nicely mapped out the social, our previously hypothesized a priori social mirroring circuitry, right? So we're sensitive all over the brain, but where we see a conjunction is in ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, temporal parietal junction, anterior insula. These are the sort of the a priori hypothesized um, social mirroring circuitry regions. Now, how do we assess brain concordance? And here I want to take a little step back and talk about this important caveat in hyperscanning research, which is known as pseudoconcordance. Because if you're delivering a stimulus to two individuals who are being scanned at the same exact time, especially lower level stimuli like auditory stimuli, visual stimuli, somatosensory stimuli, even pain stimuli, both individuals will activate the brain at the same time, just because of synchronization in that stimulus, not because there's any relationship between the two individuals. And this is called kind of like pseudo concordance, right? This, this kind of like phenomenon, this caveat in hyperscanning. And so this um, in, the, in the EEG world, this is a really nice um, paper by Burgess that talked about this. He talked about the fact that a consistent phase difference between two signals, which is kind of the mean, does not necessarily imply covariance between them. So shared fMRI activation, the dyad, may not be due to brain-to-brain -brain concordance or any sort of information transfer from a patient to a clinician or vice versa. And so instead, what you want to look at are the deviations in activity, right? So if, if overall um, there's a loud noise and my auditory cortex activates at the same exact time as your auditory cortex, it doesn't mean we're transferring any sort of information at the same time. So just simultaneous activation does not mean brain to brain concordance. So what you wanna look at is deviation. So if you go trial to trial, if you repeat this over and over again, when there's um, a high level in one individual, do you also see a high level in the other and vice versa? And so this is kind of the approach we took in terms of analysis of our functional MRI data, where we looked at multiple trials across all these trials with repetitions and you can see while overall in the temporal parietal junction, you see activation in the patient, sometimes it might be really high in some trials. And in some trials, for whatever reason, it might be really low. And so then what we're saying, what we're asking is in the clinician, do you see anywhere in the brain where you also see high activation when it's high in the patient and low activation when it's low in the patient? And you can do this for every single dyad all the way down to the 37 dyads that we explored in this original study. And so what we found then is that there was a difference between social interaction and no interaction. So if you had the intake and you built a relationship versus not having intake and not building a relationship, that's where we saw significant differences in the kind of like brain to brain concordance. And so right TPJ concordance in the patient was associated with brain concordance in these brain areas in the clinician. And there's a large number of brain areas here, admittedly, but a lot of these areas are in social mirroring circuitry areas, including ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, temporal parietal junction, anterior insula. And what we did then is that we looked at across all of these areas, which are the ones that are most relevant to analgesia, which are the ones that are linked to reduction in pain in the patient and here we found is that of all these areas, it was only the TPJ, temporal parietal junction, in the clinician that was linked to analgesia. So when TPJ activity in the patient is linked to TPJ activity in the clinician, and you have this high concordance, that's when you also have better analgesia as reported by the patient. So TPJ to TPJ dynamic, brain to brain concordance is associated with analgesia is what we found. Now, the TPJ is a really interesting area. For example, just randomly, we looked at this older study in clinicians where they had, they brought clinicians into the scanner 
they, they had them watch these videos of um, sometimes neutral conditions, sometimes very negative conditions, like, you know, a hand being harmed by a knife or a hammer or an ice pick, these like, you know, very negative kind of like visuals. And then they look to see where does the brain respond during these um, very uh, negative conditions of another experiencing pain. And what they found, and then they also had them rate their level of burnout, level of clinical burnout. And what they found is that those that had a high severity of report of emotional exhaustion and clinician burnout also had the lowest amount of response in the TPJ in response to these hand harm by knife hammer ice pick videos suggesting that you know brain activity in the TPJ is specifically related to this risk of burnout, which is really important. And so when we look at the TPJ and you look at, you can do meta-analysis of like all the fMRI clinical trials um, that have been done of um, brain response to different constructs like empathy, for example, and something called theory of mind or mentalizing. Um, both of these kinds of uh, uh, conditions yield activation in the TPJ, temporal parietal junction over here and over here. But if you contrast the two, theory of mind and empathy, that's when you really see the TPJ light up. So the TPJ is involved in empathy, but it's actually much stronger, strongly involved in theory of mind. And so like, what is theory of mind? Theory of mind or mentalizing is actually a cognitive process by which we sort of understand the, the motivations and the thoughts of another. This is called theory of mind. And so our provocative speculation here, because it was very important in our study as well, TPJ, is that if, if we were to do training, training in theory of mind might actually be even more important than empathy training for building therapeutic alliance. And the nice thing is that theory of mind is a cognitive construct. It's less of an affective construct. And so it might even be easier to do this kind of training if we were to do it to try to improve TPJ brain to brain concordance and therapeutic alliance and ultimately clinical outcomes. So um, what do we know about this neural synchrony and how does neural synchrony underlie potential behavioral synchrony? And so there was a really nice review on this. This is from the same group that did the, uh, the rodent um, brain to brain synchrony work. And what I really liked about this review is that they talked about this kind of a uh, bottleneck that when we're an experimenter and, and observing two rats behaving to one another, we can, we can quantify their behavior, but we don't exactly know everything about information transfer between the two rats, for example, by, by just looking at their behavior. And so if you were to look at and trying to be sensitive to more subtle modes of communication, that maybe the, the rat or the human isn't even able to express, right? So it's not just as simple as just, well, we can ask the humans, you know, what were you thinking when you were interacting with this person? They might not even be aware why they liked or not liked somebody, why they were, they got a good vibe from their clinician or did not get a good vibe from their clinician. And so the, uh, the motivation here is that if we're looking at brain to brain concordance and brain activity, we can sort of like get through this bottleneck of just looking at behavioral concordances. And so, you know, in the future, we're really hoping to extend our work to also look at EEG hyperscanning. And so um, this is from a uh, national, special National Geographic uh, issue on pain that highlighted some of our work. So this is, for example, this is actually a nice example of our software where you can see the, you know, patients and clinicians, you can get a full face view. And, and, and the software allows us to look at both the patient and the clinician while they're interacting in the MRI scanner and while we're running our experiments. So um, we have embarked on this EEG study looking at sort of similar concepts of patients and clinicians and um, how, you know, face-to-face -face expression mirroring, but also brain activity, dynamic concordance might be linked, you know, while the two are interacting, even like while they're having this intake, that's what the EEG allows us to do. Uh, we've also, um, and I can't stress this enough, been able to weather the storm in terms of COVID, you know, you can... Uh, think about the uh, the difficulty in doing a social neuroscience experiment with uh, patient clinician interactions during COVID, and how the heck were we able to to continue doing this during COVID when you know our institution banned us from having two individuals kind of in the same room together without a mask, and the mask you know very very much constrains um, uh, face to face mirroring that's happening, and so we were able to source these uh, uh, clear masks, which allowed for sort of like an unimpeded a relatively unimpeded uh, view of somebody's face. And, and we were able to safely continue our research 
even during um, the difficulties of the COVID pandemic. Uh, this is uh, uh, Arvina Grahl, who's modeling the mask. She's one of our lead uh, postdocs that's currently involved in the fMRI hyperscan study. Uh, so this is kind of our setup for the EEG hyperscan, where we have the two individuals, uh, a clinician and a patient interacting and undergoing an intake and undergoing um, experimental pain in a room. And the experimenters are actually outside of that room to give them as much privacy as possible. So while they're all wired up, all the wires lead out to another room, which is um, through a one-way mirror. So the, the patient and the clinician cannot, act, cannot see the experimenters but the experimenters can see the, the patient and the clinician and are able to record EEG signals in the other room. And so for, for these studies, we've actually adopted a, a really cool um, uh, construct that was introduced to us by our co-PI, Ted Kapchuk, around training clinicians to behave in a certain way, in an augmented way, very caring, versus a very limited way, kind of just the facts. Um, and so what we've been able to, to find in our EEG hyperscan study, which is led by uh, super postdoc Alessandra Anzolin, is that the care scores were significantly higher in the augmented condition versus the limited condition, which is, uh, which is great for internal validity in running our experiments. However, we did not find any differences in this case with analgesia between the augmented and the limited condition. But when we looked at the imaging results, we found that there was greater connections that were being formed during the augmented versus the limited condition. And specifically, when we looked at the temporal parietal junction, again, in this completely independent study, we were able to find that analgesia was most linked to connections and interdegree of um, theta band um, connections in the, when TPJ interdegree was there for the patient. And so it, it again highlights the importance of the TPJ for this kind of brain-to-brain um, -brain communication construct. And we're you know, we're frankly, we're still analyzing this data. Uh, we're hoping to be able to publish this soon, but um, what I'm showing you here is some unpublished results. Uh, we also are engaged in, a, in a, another fMRI hyperscan study, and this is led by Arvina Grau, and this is a longitudinal study. So the question here is, well, this is just one treatment. You know, clinicians tell us all the time, it takes me more than one treatment in order to form a bond with the patient. Well, you know, is that really the case? And so here we're looking at an augmented versus limited uh, therapeutic delivery across a longitudinal period of time. And uh, what we've been able to find is, again, for the augmented versus limited condition, much higher care scores, much better therapeutic alliance um, that uh, actually doesn't move too much over the first treatment versus the third treatment versus the sixth treatment, which is kind of like interesting. It's kind of like, you know, love at first sight when you first see somebody and you you um, either you like that clinician or you don't like that clinician. And that's fairly stable across multiple visits. Also, um, analgesia was also pretty stable across multiple visits. Everybody was getting better, whether it's um, augmented or limited condition with the acupuncture. Um, but where we did find a difference between augmented and limited is actually um, in terms of like adherence, right? So the future acupuncture, would you continue seeing this acupuncturist? Well, the augmented people wanted to see that acupuncturist, the limited did not. And, you know, do you think you'll get better pain relief if you continue seeing this acupuncturist? Well, for the augmented condition, they did feel that was the case, and much more so than for the limited. So in conclusion, understanding brain circuitry supporting patient-clinician interactions requires two-person methods. I hope I've been able to convince you of that with techniques such as hyperscanning. And I also hope I convince you that this kind of like nonverbal communication is actually very important to in order to, to share information and to... Um, as a way to kind of expressing support for patients by the clinicians. Greater TPJ to TPJ concordance and facial expression mirroring was associated with better analgesia. And so the importance of sort of theory of mind processing and potentially even theory of mind training, you know, may be very important for fostering this kind of connection and improving therapeutic alliance between patients and clinicians. And that's going to be the focus kind of like our next project that we hope to start in. So thank you very much. I definitely want to acknowledge this. This research would absolutely not be possible with without a, a very large team, right? We have you know multiple uh, scanners that are going at the same time. Uh, a lot of different kinds of data that are coming out that need analysis. Uh, my co-PI in this has been Ted Kapchuk, um, who's a, a placebo research expert, and um, the software was developed with help from a collaboration with the Korean Institute of Oriental Medicine and Chung Jing Jung. 
And uh, Dan Michael, Alessandra, and Arvina have been the lead postdocs in um, a lot of this research. So um, I thank NIH for the very generous support for continuing some of this research, as well as the foundation support that we've been able to um, amass over the years. So thank you very much. I'm going to open it up for questions. And it's it's been a pleasure to allow me to share some of our research. Amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Napado. Uh, I'm going to sneak in a quick question before we go to the floor. Um, I was so fascinated with all of your results and, and the importance of how patients are connecting um, to the clinician, as well as use of the this care measure, which um, is novel to me. I've seen the Working Alliance inventory, um, but I've, you know, this was, I'm just learning about this care measure. I, I could have missed it, but was there a measure administered to clinicians that uh, captured their perceived connection with the patients? And um, I, I wasn't following that thread through, so I'd just love for you to recap if I missed it. Yeah, we went, so first of all, thank you for that question. We, we went through a bunch of different options in terms of what questionnaires you try to assess. So we looked at the WAI, the Working Alliance Inventory. That one is geared more, like some of them are geared more towards like primary care doctors. Some of them are geared more yeah. towards psychologists and are asking questions that are not necessarily relevant for an acupuncturist. And so we we needed to kind of like scale back and try to find yeah. question questionnaires that are relevant for our kinds of clinicians that we were using. That's why we chose the CARE questionnaire. Okay. All of these questionnaires have the problem of ceiling effects. So I want to say this like yeah. upfront. And it's very hard to get the patients not to give their clinician the highest score possible. And so we we almost have to like instruct them and not have the clinician present when they're filling out these questionnaires. We tell them that the, the, the clinician is not going to see your result, you know, your response in questionnaire. So so if you're going to do this kind of research and you're you want to use these questionnaires, that's really something important to keep in mind. Um, so in our case, we did have the clinician also fill out the therapeutic alliance, the, the, the care, the care questionnaire. And we're just, they were instructed to fill it out, you know, as, as if you were kind of inferring like the quality of your relationship with the, with the patient. And so I, I showed some of that data and that showed that the, in some ways the clinicians were much harder on themselves than the patients were on the clinicians. And they gave themselves lower care scores, even for the intake. But they also found kind of like these like larger differences in, um, you know, whether they had the intake or not had the intake. Um, and uh, but we were in this case, we're, we're mostly focusing on the patients yeah. therapeutic alliance ratings, not the clinicians. But, yeah, we did have them rate that as well. You can do that. OK, great. Thank you. Um, Wendy Bernstein asked, did the provider know what was being studied? Um, yes, yes. I mean, they knew that we were studying the relationship. Um, and we, we we had to explain to them why we were scanning their brain, right? Like, why are we scanning? The, why, why are we having you get into the get into the scanner? So while we were interested in them providing the acupuncture, and we were interested in this particular case, we're, we're not so much interested in the efficacy of acupuncture and mechanisms of the efficacy of acupuncture. We're really interested in the relationship. And we were using acupuncture as kind of like a convenient clinician sample because they were able to provide acupuncture even though they're in a different room, right? There's not a lot of clinician therapeutic inter interventions that you can say that about. Terrific. Um, Sarah Margarison asks, are patterns between clinicians and patients stereotyped between dyads? If you swapped patients between clinicians, would you still see a pattern? I'm wondering if there is a universal pattern when two people interact or if it is more unique based on the individuals interacting. You know, so for the for the original study that I showed you the data for, we had each clinician saw two patient and each patient saw two clinicians. For the longitudinal study that we're doing now, it, it'd be impossible to do it that way. And so we have a much fewer number of clinicians that are part of our study engaged in this. So, so in this case, we have some clinicians that have seen many different patients. So I guess we could look to see just how stereotype, it's almost like how clinician specific would this be because the patients are always changing, but some of the clinicians are staying the same. We might be able to answer that question. I, so I, I don't know the answer to that question. And maybe I wouldn't be surprised if it's a clinician specific thing. Actually, the um, if you remember, I showed you the, the research from Ted Kapchuk that it, they used IBS patients, irritable bowel syndrome patients, and they trained acupuncturists to 
behave in either an augmented or limited way. And overall, they found that augmented um, interactions led to a better clinical outcome in the IBS patients than limited. But if you looked at differences between clinicians, what was really interesting is that some clinicians limited was better than other clinicians augmented, which is like really surprising, right? So there's something about some clinicians that just make them very effective clinicians, no matter how they deliver what it is that they're doing. And what what is that? What is this? This is like the art of medicine, right? What is that special something in that clinician? I mean, now that we have brain activity, maybe we can we can study that to see if you know we, there's differences between clinicians, and we can somehow pick up on that. That would be really fascinating. Fascinating. Troy Dilding asks: Is there a role for perceived concordance between the clinician and patient? Um, for example, shared gender or race in clinical outcomes. Yeah, I, I get asked this question a lot, and it would be super interesting to study, you know, like like a concordant sex or discordant sex, concordant race and discordant race. Um, we haven't been able to do that just because the sample that we're drawing from, you know, tends to be, you know, fairly monolithic in terms of acupuncturists. You know, patients can be more diverse, but we're really limited as to how many acupuncturists are out there and who are acupuncturists. For example, I mm -hmm. I think we only had, you know, one or two African-American acupuncturists in the original study. And just the numbers are just too low, um, given, first of all, the expense of running fMRI studies and um, the ends, the numbers that we're dealing with. And to really be able for me to confidently be able to answer this question about concordant versus dis discordant yeah. races and sexes and things like that. And sex, we might be able to do a little bit better because we do have male acupuncturists in our studies. And um I don't think we could do it in the original study, but for the longitudinal study we're doing now, I think we might have a shot at doing some analysis there. But it's 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 hard to do this work just because unless you have a dedicated study toward this and you have funding to specifically ask that question, it's it's going to be hard to have this balance. Um, yeah, if there's any acupuncturists out there, we're always uh, hungry for enrolling new acupuncturists. It's been a real struggle. Yeah, um, Troy Dildine also asks, uh, does CD at all have observed decreases in certain empathies within clinicians the longer they practice? Do you expect facial limit imitations to be impacted by how long a clinician has been seeing patients? Hmm. Um, well, we do record um, kind of how long that clinician has been in practice. Um, we could look at sort of across across subjects. I mean, it's going to be confounded by age and things like that. So we'd have to, um, I think, regress out age. Um, yeah, it's a good, it's, it's a good question. Um, we have, we have not looked at that, I would say, but um, I also like, wouldn't just like make the assumption that just because somebody has been in practice a really long time, they have necessarily drop their empathy or drop their empathic ability. Um, there's plenty of very effective older clinicians out there too. So it might be interesting to do this in like in, med, in a medical school sample, looking at med students as they go through their period and, um, you know, go through their struggles and in terms of burnout and empathy and things like that. Um, Mert asks, uh, I have a question related to theory of mind. Can we say that in civilizations where religious or positive philosophy um, are outweighed, such as Far East, India, China, will have better clinical response in contrast to Western civilization? Yeah, this is super interesting. So the, the whole um, augmented versus limited construct and the, the results that that Ted Kapchuk showed in that IBS study that I keep referring back to, which showed that augmented was superior to limited. That's, I mean, that study was done, you know, here in the West, in uh, in the Boston area. We, um, this, this hasn't been published yet, but we conducted a similar study in, I think it was functional dyspepsia population in Korea and found the opposite. We found that limited interactions actually led to better outcomes than augmented in that case, or at the very least, not different between the two. And there's something about expectancies. There's something about um, cultural differences in what you expect from a clinician, from a provider. And, you know, there's this whole ro uh, role about competence. So I didn't show any of this data, but I think in our current study, we're looking at competence versus uh, empathy in terms of ratings of the patients. And 
In our augmented versus limited conditions, there was no differences in competence ratings between the two conditions, but there was a difference in like empathy that was delivered, right? So I wouldn't be surprised if in a culture in like say the Far East, there might even be significant difference in um, in competence ratings. I don't know if we used that questionnaire back then, but where limited limited interactions might be rated as higher competence than augmented interactions because you're just like, why are you asking me all these questions about my my brother and my wife and my family and my dog and like this is nothing related to my pain. You know, you're obviously not a very competent clinician if you're asking me these questions, right? That might be going through the mind of some patients in certain cultures where they're just not expecting that. And so there might be very interesting cultural differences uh, that maybe we'd be able to pick up with brain imaging as well. Okay, last question. This is from Mario Nava. Good day, doctor. Mr. Alvarez here, last year, medical student from Mexico. In the context of my country, there are patients who think that if they're not prescribed pharmacologic management, you're not doing anything and don't believe, and they don't believe in non-pharmacologic measures. The question is, what advice would you give us in primary care to guide patients who are reluctant to take into account non-pharmacologic options? How to break this barrier to improve the doctor-patient relationship and thus have the benefits we saw today? Yeah, that's a big question, right? Um, I, think, I think part of being a good clinician is understanding who is sitting across the table from you, who is your patient, and what kind of techniques are most effective for that patient. And for some patient, pulling out some research papers and showing them this research that says, look, um, you know, exercise therapy can be, physical therapy can be extremely effective for your low back pain. You know, uh, forms of uh, psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy can be very effective for your back pain. Acupuncture can be very effective for your back pain. Here's the research studies, large research studies in from reputable hospitals support this. And for some patients, they'll resonate with that and they say, huh, that's interesting. Maybe this will be effective for me. For other patients, maybe they don't care about that, right? And then you have to approach them in a different way to get them to try something that's not necessarily a pill that they're taking. And part of your job as a clinician of being a good clinician is kind of understanding who the patient is in front of you and having the experience to know how to relate to that person and how to get across the message that across. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Napado, for an excellent um, sharing of all of your fascinating science. Um, we've all learned so much today. You've been getting a lot of applause and balloons and hearts along the way, appreciation from the audience. Yeah, um, really terrific lecture. Um, so thank you again for, for this great talk. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, as a reminder, we will post this lecture online for enduring content. Please visit our YouTube channel and also please join us next month for Dr. Claire Ashton James, where she will be, um, she's nicely teed up from Dr. Napado's lecture because she's gonna be talking about social aspects of pain. Um, so look forward to seeing you all next month and take care. <laughs>